Welcome to our panel discussion today. I'm so excited for this one as we've already had an, an incredible morning and early afternoon of content. So I know this panel will follow suit and bring us even more insightful and inspiring uh, stories and content moving forward. So uh, just to start, I wanna introduce myself for those who don't know who I am. I am Grace Howes. I'm the Community and Public Relations Coordinator with the YW. But more importantly, I'm your room moderator today. Um, I just want to let folks know about a little bit about me. I am a leader um, as a team member at the YW. I am a leader as the um, coordinator of this event and as a proud member of the Niagara region. Um, as we do before all of these sessions, we love to start with a, a land acknowledgement. Uh, so we'll start this panel today by acknowledging the land on which we live. Uh, live and work is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples, many of whom continue to live and work here today. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties and is within the land uh, protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. This, uh, today, this gathering place is home to many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples, and acknowledging reminds us that our great standard of living is directly related to the resources and friendship of Indigenous people. Um, continuing on, we also want to talk a little bit about the YW, as the YWCA CA, Niagara Region is the host of the Leadership Summit. Uh, the YWCA Niagara Region is a local organization uh, that stands for gender equity and gives a voice to those who are the most marginalized in our community. Uh, the YW offers emergency uh, shelter and services, as well as three stages of transitional housing to homeless women, men, and families to help clients step-by-step step break the cycle of poverty and homelessness for good. Um, we'll take an, another opportunity to talk a bit about our community guidelines. The Niagara Leadership Summit for Women virtual space is a safe and inclusive environment. Uh, we invite you to uh, become familiar with our community guidelines on the important documents tab of the platform. Uh, and by participating in this panel, you're agreeing to follow those guidelines. Uh, we are responsible for making an inclusive and env um, environment for all, and we thank you for being a part of making that possible. Uh, now, next up, uh, I'm going to introduce you to all the wonderful women uh, sitting virtually beside me um, at the summit today. So first up is your panel host, Katawi Henry. Uh, Katawi lives and works in the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, Huron, Wendat, and Neutral Peoples working as a human rights and anti-racism advisor at Brock University, Katawi operates under the anti-racism, anti-oppression framework. She works to prevent and address har harassment and discrimination at Brock University, and I'd also like to welcome her today as a board member of the YWCA. Now, uh, in no particular order, I'd like to introduce you to your panelists who are, we are welcoming to the summit today. The first one is Safa Khan. Safa is a fourth year medical student at Brock University. She holds multiple leadership roles, including a student mentor, a faculty representative for Brock Student Union, and a chair on committees such as the Sexual Violence Support and Education Committee and the Undergraduate uh, First Senate Committee. She's passionate about empowering women and being a role model to young women so they can too pursue their goals. Thank you, Safa, for being with us today on this panel. Uh, next up, I'm going to introduce Michelle Grochest. Help me out, Michelle. Good, good try, Groholski. Groholski. I uh, practiced a ton on how to pronounce it this morning, and obviously, when the camera is on, we always have troubles. So, thank you, Michelle, for your support. Um, for over a decade, Michelle. Uh, has designed and led equity, diversity, and inclusion strategies across a, a variety of industries, including high tech, financial services, land, property, and construction, and health, with organizations ranging from one uh, just to a few individuals to thousands of individuals. Michelle has used her voice to ignite change. Her work has been recognized globally with numerous awards and distinctions and has led meaningful improvements to organizational and uh, engagement, empowerment, inclusion, and customer experience scores. Thank you so much, Michelle, for joining us on this panel today. And then lastly, I want to introduce you to your final panelist, Sherry Darlene. Sherry discovered herself 
uh, and activ activism from an early age. Growing up, seeing racism and discrimination against people of color and experiencing it herself, Sherry recognized the importance of standing up for what you believe in, and she knew that something had to be done. Sherry always knew that she was a born leader, and on June 6th of 2020, she found her purpose organizing the hashtag Justice for Black Lives uh, movement. Thank you so much, Sherry, for being with us today. And this is the moment you've been waiting for. I will disappear now, and I'll leave it to Katawi. Take it away. Thank you so much, Grace. I'm so excited to be here and, and engage in the conversation. Um, I want to be respectful of everyone's time, so I'm going to jump right into the questions. First question, um, a little bit of an introduction, but um, you know, tell us about yourselves and tell us um, what are your roles in the Niagara community? Um, whoever would like to speak first, feel free. I don't mind going first. <laughs> Sorry, beat you to it, Sherry. <laughs> but my name is Safa. I think Grace did a great job of covering basically who I am. Um, it's great to hear other people talk about you. It's kind of cool. <laughs> but yeah, so I am in my fourth year of medical sciences at Brock University. I hold multiple executive positions in clubs and I'm in student government. Um, I also hold a seat on multiple committees, such as the Sexual Violence Support and Education Committee, the Undergraduate Program Committee for Senate, and Clubs Policy Committee and Appeals, and so on and so forth. It's the list, I just, sometimes it's hard to remember all of them. <laughs> but you know what, it's just great to like get engaged because, you know, people my age, uh, we just, I feel like we should be getting more engaged with this stuff. So I'm really excited to be here. So thank you. Go ahead, Sherry. I saw that you had your hand up. mute up there. Okay, uh, again, just like Sasha said, um, Grace did a really good job. So I'll just kind of explain to you how Justice for Black Lives is out in the community now since June 6. So we all know that Sherry thought there was going to be 50 to 100 people show up on June 6 and we had well over 4,000. So that kind of opened the door. Now Justice for Black Lives is really out in the community. We're doing mediation mentorship. We have um, an exhibit at the Niagara Falls History Museum. We've got book clubs and we're, we're not stopping there. We, uh, we've got so much on the plate. It's so exciting. <laughs> so pay attention, justiceforblacklives.com. <laughs> oh, Everyone you guys bookmark that right away. Uh, absolutely. I'm Michelle, as uh, Grace had mentioned. Um, my purpose, my passion in this world is about dismantling the systems and practices and policies that keep qualified, amazing people from rising into and within organizations. Um, I'm all about helping organizations to move from talking about it to actually doing it, to changing the way that they make decisions every day. Uh, I'm also a board of director from Leadership Niagara. And my favorite role that I get to play right now is mama to a one-year-old and a three-year-old. So behind the scenes, there's a lot of toys that I'm hiding. Um, most challenging role and the most interesting these days for sure. Thank you. Um, so the next question um, would be, what does diversity and inclusion look like to you? And how do you advocate for these values in your everyday life? Whoever would like to speak first, feel free if you want to raise your hand. Go ahead, Sherry. So diversity and inclu inclusion looks like my life, my family. Um, we've always had a rainbow, so to speak, so to speak, um, in my family. Never have I not had a white uncle or a white aunt or, you know, a native. Um, so we're just one great big mounting pot. And that's what diversity and inclusion looks like to me, my life, my family. And I know a lot of other people's families look like that too. And as far as how I advocate that out in the community, again, justice for Black lives is, um, one of the most recent things we've gotten in, into is mediation. So if there is um, an issue and it's believed to be racially motivated, uh, Justice for Black Lives will go out and we'll, you know, we have a process. If both parties are willing to speak to us, then we sit down with both parties. If I feel, I will tell the truth, whether I think it's racially motivated or not. And even if it, if I feel like it is, I, I'm, 
comfortable having the under the uncomfortable conversation with a person I believe that has a racist ideology. And I think when you give them that comfort zone without criticism and let them know that you can change your thought and I'm gonna show you how to do it and I'm gonna teach you through education. We've been very successful and I am really, really proud of that, what we're doing as far as mediation. And sometimes the other neighbors aren't willing to talk to us. So we can show them better than we can ever tell them that um, you know, you're not gonna, you're not gonna keep doing what you're doing, terrorizing these families. And we have pull-ups. We had a pull-up and it was fantastic and it was peaceful. And more importantly, it let the family know that they were no longer alone. And it let his neighbors that were terrorizing him and his family that you're gonna stop doing this because it's not 1930 and you're not allowed to conduct yourself like that anymore. So that's how we're out in the community amongst other ways. Go ahead, Safa. Thank you, Sherry. I honestly love that you said that, Sherry, because when I think about advocating, actually, let me just first off start off with what do I think diversity and inclusion looks like to me? Um, it's about respecting each other's differences and really embracing them. Like being able to see that there's people out there that are different. Like those people that keep saying, I don't see race. It's like, why are you, why are you saying, why are you erasing my identity, right? See me and just embrace it, celebrate each other. So that's what I think diversity and inclusion is all about. And how I advocate it is just like you said, it's having that uncomfortable conversation and being comfortable with it. So being, I, I think it's just by being a good role model, encouraging people to be true to themselves and showing them that everyone's celebrated, that you're, that we see you and we love you. You know what I mean? And um, I've also signed up for multiple workshops that promote diversity and inclusion, just educating myself on it too, because I feel like there's always more to learn about things like this, especially in, with this, like today, like you don't know what's going on. And sometimes you just need to, you know, learn more because every day, you know, you have, you can learn. And then um, at Brock University, actually, they have this thing called the CWC. It's the campus wide co curriculum. There's actually an entire domain dedicated to diversity and inclusion. And you learn about accessibility, sexuality, race, religion, all of these things. And it's really important, I think, to the fact that I got to participate in the CWC and even engage further on in school is, it's a great step. I'm seeing really good progress. So, yeah. Thank you, Safa. Michelle? So when I think about diversity and inclusion, what comes to mind for me is um, the, the importance of also calling out equity. I think equity is another important element of this equation. Diversity is the mix of people, right? So it's our racial uh, identification, it's our gender identity, it's whether we have a disability, if it, our indigeneity, for example. It's who we are. Inclusion is about what we experience. Do we feel like our voices are heard? Do we feel like we can be ourselves? Do we feel like we're valued? That is what inclusion is. And equity is all about fairness. It's about transparency and consistency. So it's not enough to have diversity at the table. I mean, diversity at the table is important. Don't get me wrong, right? We have to have diversity at the table. But we also need to make sure that when people come into our communities, into our organizations, into our homes, that we're treating them in the way that they ought to be treated, right? That we're seeing how much potential and talent they have and that we are removing any bias that we that factors into our decision-making. So we need to have the three in order to be the kind of society that we collectively as Canadians want to think we are, right? We have an aspiration around being inclusive. I think what we are today is diverse, um, but maybe not as inclusive and as equitable as, as we would like. So we have some work to do. Absolutely, thank you so much. Um, to, to move the conversation along, um, we're wondering, you know, as we all know, the political um, and business leadership in the Niagara region lacks a true representation of the communities that they serve. How can we move this needle from within organizations and political offices? Maybe I'll reverse the order. Go ahead, Michelle. That sounds good. And then Safa, I'll pass it over to you. I see your hand was up. Yes, so this is a significant challenge that we're seeing, a lack of representation in Niagara's businesses and particularly within the senior leadership ranks. And when you talk with people, and this is not just in Niagara, this is across the board, often people's mind first goes to, well, there's just a lack of talent. There's a lack of qualified 
talent for these roles, right? And I'm seeing Safa nodding her head, no. And I can't see the chat, but I'm hoping that you're also chatting to say no. That's not the case. We have incredible talent in Niagara. Talent does not discriminate on the basis of gender identity, on the basis of your age, on the basis of your skin color, right? What we're seeing is that, is that there's a lack of equitable practice and policy that enables great people from entering into and rising within organizations. So it kind of reminds me of, given that many of us identify as women, the, the discussion in the 90s was women aren't elevating in, in organizations. We're not getting promoted because we lack confidence. So the solution is just fix women. There's something wrong with women's confidence. And if we can just fix women's confidence, then they'll rise, right? Well, we know that that's not the case. There's reasons why women display a lack of confidence. There are systemic barriers that women face that erode our confidence, that diminish our voices over time. The same is to be said with other aspects of diversity. So when you see a lack of racial representation, it's not that black, brown, Asian individuals lack talent. It's that we are blaming the pipeline or blaming the talent for their lack of presence within the organization when the real issue is our systems are flawed, that we are basing our decisions on who has been in our organizations in the past, which typically are white, heterosexual, cisgendered people without disabilities, whom I love. I'm married to one. Um, but these are the people who we see in our organizations. So we need to change the systems, practices, and policies and not point our finger to the people as being the root cause of why we lack representation in our businesses. I'll get off my high horse and pass the microphone over to Safa. Thank you so much, Michelle. Just to add in quickly before you go, Safa, that reminds me of one of my favorite quotes that says, I'm not really concerned with the um, Einsteins of the world, but those whose um, intellect was wasted on plantation fields and in sweatshops. So I think a lot about that while you were speaking. Thank you. Um, go ahead, Safa. Honestly, th those were some really good points, Michelle. I was just thinking that that's actually tying in perfectly to what I was going to say. I think to have more women participate in these leadership platforms, business, politics, anything should be, you know, they should just have the businesses, the politics, they should be more open and inclusive to the, to us because it's not about the people being the problem. It's the businesses. It's the mentality that the businesses are having, the politics. I, I was thinking the other, I was just thinking about how, um, when's the last time we saw a woman prime minister, a woman president? I don't even think we've had a woman president. I mean, I'm not super keen on politics. I don't know them like the back of my hand or anything, but I do know that I think we had one prime minister that was a woman and then she lasted not even her full term or something like that. And now that's how everyone sees women are to be in. I, I just don't understand why it's, it's just, it, it's honestly, I think it bought the fact that it bothers me is that it should bother them, you know, not just us as women, we shouldn't be the only ones bothered by this. Right. And just to have more representation, because that's how we can move like forward. It's not just moving in general. It's we need to move forward. We can't just keep circling around the same thing unless we actually do something. Right. And I think that's what they should do to move the needle within the organizations and political offices, they need to move forward with their thinking, move forward with what they're doing and their actions. If they're not, if they're just saying, it's like, you know, you can talk the talk, but if you can't walk the talk, then you're not doing anything. You're just all talk, you know? So that's what I was thinking about for that. Absolutely. It's like, you know, people say, um, talk is cheap. Well, I like to add to that. Well, and you sound broke <laughs> because, um, you know, what you're adding to the conversation, you're not actually practicing. So, you know, save your pennies. <laughs> um, thank you so much for that, Safa. Sherry, would you like to add? So, again, I agree with Safa and Michelle. Um, just to add to that, I think what really needs to happen is we have to be intentional. We have to be intentional on, you know, on every level, our local government, our education system, our justice system, we have to be intentional on seeking out people of color, women. Um, we have to be intentional on providing, um, instead of, you know how in the States they have the um, school to prison pipeline. And it, you know, I saw a documentary probably about last year in which they actually go to the schools in grade three and they, do a calculation of how many young black boys are in the class. And that's what they build their prisons based on. 
So that that is disturbing. So rather that that is intentional and calculated behavior, right? So why can't we do the same? Be intentional, be calculated. Instead of going to count so you can build your prisons, let's go in there and let's expose our kids to political science at a very young age. Let's expose our children to human rela um, human relations, race relations. These are all things that Justice for Black Lives is not going to stop until we have it implemented in our school system. It, it has to start with education and we have to be intentional. And that's again, women of color, disabled, um, uh, people of color, like it, it has to be intentional because otherwise we're going to remain where we are. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Um, I, I definitely um, see the themes in that in, in what, you know, the work that your, your organization is doing. Um, Safa, I, I wanted to um, ask you a little bit about, you know, how as a student leader in post-secondary, um, you know, how have you conquered some of the obstacles that you've come across as a young racialized leader? No, that's a, thank you for asking me that actually. Um, sometimes I think about when I was growing up, how different it was because compared to, I guess, maybe like how my parents, you know, grew up because I was the only brown student in my class, for example. And I, all my, all my peers, they were all white. And I, I always wondered what, why couldn't I be white? Because the way I was treated, it was like, it was, uh, it's like it was a crime to be brown you know what I mean the way the kids look and like I had darker facial hair because um but like every every kid has facial hair like it's literally it's a fact okay I've noticed this but it's like the it's like lighter on um some on white people and then it's darker on like darker skin tones which is completely normal it's natural biological actually and um, I remember this kid came, this girl, she came up to me and she was like, you look like a boy because you have a mustache. And I was like, I, I remember crying for days and thinking, why can't I just not be like this? Why couldn't I be like them? And just, you know, coming through, like seeing that, like going through that, like my whole life, it's, um, it really hurts, you know? And then I remember, so like, these are just a couple of obstacles I'm just um, detailing, sorry. Um, but yes, like, there was, I remember growing up, that was a lot of an issue and I would come home crying to that and I, I hated it. And another obstacle that came, but then I remember saying, my, I told my parents and my mom was super, you know, reassuring. And she'd tell me like, don't like be afraid to be who you are. You know what I mean? Like, they're just jealous is what, is what I, <laughs> and I'm like, you know what? Okay. It's, that's it. They're just jealous of who I am. <laughs> But um, also there was recent, like recently my mother, um, she got, she went through a very traumatic time um, with my father. He was very abusive, both physically and um, verbally. And I guess being raised around that where he kept, you know, like it would always be subtle around me. Like I wouldn't really notice it as much. Like, you know, like, oh, why aren't you going to do the dishes? Why aren't you doing why aren't you getting the food get the food ready and and i would always think like is that what the women's role is is it to just do what you're told and just shut up about it or and is that what i i have to think about but you know what like i i watched my mom go through that and then stand up against it and you know fight for it uh, fight against it in terms of you know now she's separated with him and um, I'm seeing her getting engaged in so many things. She's back in school now. And I'm just seeing a whole different perspective on what I thought initially what a woman's role was supposed to be, especially in the household. And to see her go through all that really like pushed me to be, you know, better, I guess it makes sense. Because I think what happens is when you're growing up and you have this mentality of what something's supposed to be like, and then you see what it can't, what then you start changing the way you think. You know what I mean? It changes your brain chemistry. I'm not exactly sure. I know I'm in, I'm in medical and, <laughs> and I don't exactly know what I'm talking about. Don't tell my prof, but <laughs> it, that's what it is. And I think now seeing her as such a great role model is really inspiring to me as her daughter. And I have a younger sister. Um, she's 11 years old. And I feel like seeing 
two amazing female leaders at home is where it starts. And then I went and I overcame that by staying positive through everything, you know, um, even when things are getting really tough and you think that, you know, there's no hope, you know, not, you just persevere, you know, through inner strength. And there's always, you know, the, the saying there's light at the end of the tunnel. It's true. There is light at the end of the tunnel. You just have to go through the dark until you get there. And then, you know, like uh, my favorite movie, Finding Nemo, um, what Dory says is just keep swimming. You know, that is what you got to do. You've got to just keep swimming because honestly, it's things are going to get tough. Like I'm not saying life is all sunshine, rainbows and daisies. It's not. It's there are going to be tough, tough things that you're going to feel like, why is the world against you? But at the end of the day, like you got to go through that. It, I think it makes you, I, I feel like it just makes you stronger like inside and you just, you're able to like, even if you don't go through that, honestly, that's great too. <laughs> but you know, it, I think it strengthened me personally and um, that's how I was able to overcome all my obstacles. So thank you for that question. Thank you so much for your answer. Um, noting that, I'm starting to think a little bit about ideas of support. So I have a question for Michelle. Um, you know, what is active allyship, and you know, how can um, active allyship support BIPOC communities? Love the word active because it has to be. It has to be an ongoing, continual process that we are willing to go through. That is quite frankly uncomfortable. Um, especially for those of us who look like me. If you're a person of privilege and your skin is white, it's about you examining the beliefs that you have inside of your own brain and how you might be outside of your intention and outside maybe of even your awareness, complicit with systems that hold other people back, you know, quite frankly. So it's an ongoing process where we recognize our own privilege where we challenge our own biases and beliefs, our own racism, our own prejudice, our own homophobia, for example. And then we work in solidarity with our colleagues, not, not for them, not in a savioristic way, but like shoulder to shoulder, shoulder as allies in solidarity to dismantle the systems that are keeping some of us from rising. So it's this ongoing process that we all need to go through. And the reason why it's important that we do this, to be quite frank, is that um, we, we have a responsibility. You know, white people created racism, full stop, right? Like racialized people did not create racism and yet we expect them to figure it out and solve for it. So we need to play our part in being the solution. And that means that we have to take the onus on our own shoulders to read, to listen, to ask questions, um, to become aware of all of the things that are happening in our world that signal inequity. Like for example, in a meeting, who are the people who are asked to take the meeting minutes? Who are the people who are creating the agendas? Who's organizing the social committees? Who's setting up the logistics for the meetings? I'm willing to bet it's the women in your office. And if you have racialized people in your office, it's probably the racialized women in your office who are doing that, right? So start to notice that. Start to notice who people are listening to when they speak in a meeting. Start noticing who you're listening to. Are there certain people who, when they speak, you start jotting down notes to try to capture what they're saying? Are there certain people that you're interrupting more than others? Um, and to do that with some gentleness, because it's not intentional. Most of us don't wake up every day and say, you know who I'm gonna favor? I'm gonna favor white Italian um, women, just like me. Like, no, <laughs> most people don't think that way. There's something very instinctual that we've learned in our brains that happens instantaneously within a matter of seconds that cause us to give someone trust, to give someone credibility where we're not extending the same to someone else. So it's really important that we do this. And also the research bears it out that even when the exact same words are used. So let's say with Safa's example, someone hears her say, someone hears someone say that comment about facial hair, right? If Sherry called it out, and if I called it out, even though we use the same words, research has shown that I, as a white person, would be believed 
more than Sherry, that you would hear me call it out and be like, that's not okay. And you would be more willing to go, oh yeah, yeah, that was not okay. And in fact, I feel a little bit guilty and I'm going to apologize to Safa. If Sherry calls it out, even though she said the same thing as me, you're less likely to see that that was a credible call out and start to go, oh, Sherry, whatever, she's an angry black woman. And you might think that I'm being sensational, but I promise you that smarter people than me have proven this in studies over time. So we as people of privilege absolutely have a responsibility to call this out because we created it, because it lives inside of our brains and because people listen to us when we talk about it and when we call it out, but we can't do it unless we're willing to do the work. So I'll leave you with a couple of thoughts on how you can do your work. And then I'm gonna gladly hand the, the microphone over to Sherry. Um, first of all, start picking up books from voices that you typically don't hear about, right? So there's a ton of amazing authors who are sharing their voices around racism, around prejudice, homophobia, ageism, start to reach out and ask yourself, are you only listening to people who are like you? You know, it's great to learn, learn about racism from Robin DiAngelo, but she's a white woman. Like, why aren't you listening to Ibram Kendi or Leila Saad? Like, there are so many voices. Um, ask yourself that. Go on Harvard's website, start doing the implicit association test, which tells you how biased you are against certain groups. You know, learn about whether or not you're more favorable to people who are younger versus older or gay versus not. So, you know, start figuring out what your associations are and then notice your preferences. Who are you gravitating towards? Who are your circle of friends? Who are you following on Instagram? Who's on your LinkedIn? Are you favoring people who look like you or who remind you of the dominant majority? Or are you starting to listen to voices and incorporate others who need to be heard? So lots of work to do, but it starts within yourself. We cannot change systems unless we're willing to change our own minds. Sherry. Thank you, Michelle. I appreciate those um, tangible tasks. I see that Safa has her hand up and then I have a question for Sherry. I just wanted to bring up the, um, not bring up, but add on to that. Um, the thing about where you need to focus on yourself. I realize that a lot of people are really quick to point the finger at other, uh, sorry. In, I, I can't speak um, at others, but they can't, they don't really think, take the, the moment to like, see that sometimes the problem could be also within yourself, but you're so easy to judge others that you're not, you're not willing to see that sometimes you need to look in the mirror. You know what I mean? So that's a really, I think that's a really good point because even like, even when you think that you're, you're doing so many, so, so much good, but like sometimes even you're not noticing what you're doing wrong. And I think that was a really good point. So I just thought that that was, I just wanted to add on to that. Thank you. Um, so I have a question for Sherry. Um, so Sherry, you organized um, Justice for Black Lives, um, the protest in Niagara um, over the summer. Um, as a black woman, you've had to deal with racism and bias your whole life. So the, you know, justice needed for black folks is not new to you. Um, however, um, you know, I'm wondering, have you noticed a shift in society in regards to the conversations being had about race? And then um, further, what's next for justice for black lives? Um, I, yeah, I have noticed a, a shift. Um, a lot of it is, um, I feel like, um, I feel like some, uh, like a lot of our allies, the conversation is, I, I just, they, it's almost like, I'm sorry, I'll just kind of, cause there's so much in my brain, like tell them, tell them, no. <laughs> but um, I feel like they're willing to have the conversation, but more importantly, they're willing to listen. And everybody wants to know, well, what was it about George Floyd? What was it that you think that opened people's eyes? and Mm, for people of color, it, it wasn't George Floyd, it wasn't Ahmaud Arbery, it wasn't Mike Brown, it was not them individually, it was collectively thousands and decades and decades of this going on. So it wasn't just the one. What I think happened is when white people acknowledge black pain, that is when the conversations are held. And that's what happened. What happened was, George Floyd was humanized. It was hard to look at him on the ground, pleading for his life, begging for his dead mother, die in front of you. It humanized him because you've been told we're animals. You've been told we're violent. You've been told we're aggressive. And that, what they saw in George Floyd, that, that didn't fit 
wasn't an animal. He was a human being who was begging and pleading for his life and crying out for his dead mother. So I think that's what happened. And that's what sparked, because we know we can go back as far as history. We, as a Black person, we've been telling for centuries, this is what's going on. Hey, when the police stop us, sometimes we get beat up, sometimes we get killed unjustly. We've been, you know, go back in our music. You can go back 50, 60 years. It's in our music. It's in our videos. It's in our, you know, it, we've been saying this, but it's not until white people acknowledge the Black pain is when we start to have these conversations. So white people, society in itself, are willing to have the conversation now. They're willing to acknowledge black pain, but that's not all white people. Cause at the same time, we've got our white allies coming to us. Well, you got, you got the white ones who are, you know what, I'm tired of hearing about it. And you know, what's the difference? You had a black president, what are you complaining about? You know, so you're basically asking us. And at the end of the day, we're just asking for equality. We're, that's it. That's it, like Michelle said, we need that equity, right? We need to, it's like the 100 meter dash, right? Our white counterparts, they're crossing the finish line and then they're blowing the gun for us to start the race. So we need to start there before we can have equality. We need to have fair level play. And that's all we're asking for. We're not asking for special treatment. We're not asking for special centers. We're not asking for money. We want to be equal. That's all we ever wanted. But you have a society that is asking us to accept that you've gone from keeping us in bondage, murdering us unjustly, kidnapping our children, to murdering them at the side of the road unjustly. Um, we've gone from, you're asking us to accept this system that you designed. You're asking us to accept that, um, you know, back then we would be murdered if we're found out that we could read. Now you're asking us to accept a system that says, well, we're not going to murder you because you can read. But what we are going to do is we're going to redline you, put you in the poorest neighborhoods and provide your children with the lowest level of education. And you should just shut up and be happy with that. That's not equal. That's not fair. That's not level. And that's all we've ever been asking for. So I find that just as much as we have our white allies coming out and be willing to have these conversations, we've got just as many saying, ah, stop the press. You come far enough. What else do you want? Kind of thing. And this is the kind of, like I mentioned to you guys yesterday in our conversations, one of my biggest and hardest tasks to date since Justice for Black Lives has got off the ground is trying to get through to those kind of people. You know, because our, some of our allies, you know, they're willing to to listen to that and they're willing to learn about it. Like Michelle was saying, do your work. You know, um, unfortunately, I, I'd have to say 50% of the thousands of people that showed up on June 6, that was an emotional need satisfied for them. They were upset what they saw, what they, you know, what they heard. It was just upsetting to them and coming out with their signs and yelling and being part of something that satisfied that emotional that they felt about it. But I need you to go a step further if you want to be an ally. I need you to have those hard conversations with your white counterparts when you hear you know, nonsense when you hear ignorance. I need you to do your history and don't just go back and read the books 50 years ago. Go back to the beginning. Go back to the brutality. Go back to the level in which they calculated, they studied how to break our families. The Black father's not in the home today because it was intentional to have him out of the home. It, they went, the means in which they went to, to destroy the black family is incredible. And when you go and you educate yourself about that, you can become, you're, you come to your demonstration, you hold up your signs, you're here. You're an ally and we appreciate it. But I need you to come up here with me. So when you walk in the door with me, you can really link arms with me and understand. If you can understand my pain, you can understand where I've come from. You can understand my ancestral background. Uh, you know, one thing I, I watched the Harriet, no, I watched Underground while I was, uh, I had surgery recently. So I had to stay home and watch TV. It wasn't terribly upset, but I watched the series Underground. And although being a black woman, I know, as most of us know that, you know, we ran for freedom. Our ancestors ran for freedom from enslavement. But what I was really ignorant to was the distance. 600 miles, barefoot, beaten, hungry, dirty, swamps, snakes, alligators, 600 
miles. I don't think I, I would, it just, it's incredible to me. And not only did you have that alone is a task, 600 miles. So you, if you, if you can get behind Terry Fox, who had his van and he had his water and he was able to take a rest when he wanted, why can't you, if you can understand what a task it was for him, I need you to be able to understand what my ancestors had to have gone through six and a whole at the whole time running for their lives. You didn't just go on a journey. You were running for your life. You knew if you got caught, that meant death. That meant, you know, maiming you, or it, it just was so, so brutal. And it was such an incredible distance that I was really ignorant to that. And it, it literally brought tears to my eyes. I'm not sure if you guys know, but my great, great grandmother is the oldest living American in the United States. She's 116 years old. She is still alive today. She just celebrated her 116th birthday on August 15th. Yes. And she is, and I've had conversations with her and some, some are very painful, but this is why I don't know if it touches me deeper because I, I can, she tells me about being on the plantation. Although she was a freed slave, there was really, it's not like they could go to the store and get a job. Those were the jobs that were offered to them. So although she was a free slave, she still worked on a plantation. She tells me stories of how, you know, when they had to use the bathroom, there was no, you're not going in the house. There was no Pacific place. They literally just had to go dig a hole in the ground and they couldn't take more than two minutes or, you know, even though they were freed, they would still get whipped. And this is, uh, my heart just bleeds. And I, I think honestly, like um, Grace said, when she introduced me, I always knew I was a leader. It was not until June 6th that I, it came very clear to me why I'm here in Canada, why I went through what I went through as a child, all the discrimination, all the emotional and mental um, that I went through, the troubles that I went through. It was so that I could be here today and do what I'm doing and move forward. As long as I have breath in my body, this is what I'll be doing. Absolutely, that's Thank really you. powerful. Thank you so much. I see that Safa has her hand up and then I see that there's a question from the audience. Um, you know, when you mentioned the 100 meter dash, that really brought to my mind this video I watched on Facebook about privilege. So there was like, they lined up like a lot of people and um, like outside in a big field. And then they said, okay, take a step forward. And like, and to get a hundred dollars, it was like the, the prize if you won the race. Um, take us, they kept going through a series of questions, take a step forward if, you know, you've been through something like this or um, not something like, not been through, but if you have had no issues with um, getting a ride to school, some stuff like that, you know what I mean? Like that questions that had to do with privilege. And at the end, a lot of the um, like white people um, were ahead in the race. And, um, and then they ended up like when, when they went off to, to win the, like to start the race, like they ended up winning, even though um, a lot of the people, like the people said in the video that like probably those people, the, the black people in the back, they were really fast and they were like really good at sprinting and stuff, but then they ended up not winning because they were so far behind, you know? And that really, that's what came to my mind when you said that, because they're winning the race and then saying, okay, you can go now. Like when you said that, and I was just like, wow, it's actually crazy. Cause then you can actually, that's a visual representation of the, the gap that is going on with privilege here and that people need to like actually acknowledge it. And I remember we actually did that, that, that exercise in high school too. And I remember noticing it just in my own classroom that there was so, so many differences in privilege. And I think it's really important to acknowledge the, that those, that you acknowledge your privilege because if you don't if you don't understand like how lucky you are you're not going to be able to understand why somebody can't do something you can why somebody else is struggling more than than you and that, there's no reason why you should be judging them for that because you are luckier than they are exactly right yeah so that's what i thought and i think that was a really good um message with what you were saying there, um, Sherry. And that's what came, literally it, it brought that to my mind. So it's really powerful. 
And just a very quick point for me, I know, Katawa, you want to get to the next question. Just because you're privileged doesn't mean that you haven't worked hard to get to where you are. And it doesn't mean that you're a bad person, right? It just means that you were given certain advantages in this world. So as we think about this theme of our conference, Together We Rise, right? Yes, there's an element of you rising that had to do with how hard you worked, right? And how much you wanted it and how gritty and, and how much you persevered. But there's also an element to how hard, far, far you've risen that has to do with what you look like, you know, the group with which you belong. So, you know, as you reflect on yourself rising, ask yourself, who might not be able to rise to the same extent that I am because of inherent characteristics that shouldn't matter, but do? And what can I do to link arms with them so that when I'm rising, they can rise too? It's really important. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Seth. I appreciate those um, insights. Um, to, to build on that, um, Deborah has asked, um, how do you get the individuals in positions of power to understand that they're actually perpetuating a system of exclusion? Um, so I know that's a big question. Um, I'll give some, you folks some time to think about it, but put your hand up if you'd like to, to speak to that. Hypnosis and surgery. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's tough. It's, it's really tough. I have to tell you, I speak to hundreds of employees every single week about their experiences of harassment, discrimination, bullying, Katawa, you probably do too, given your role. Um, oftentimes, the people at the top are not aware that this is happening and that they're actually perpetuating or feeding into a system that reinforces it. So what's really important is that we amplify voices. So we listen to people's lived experiences and that, that gets filtered up to leaders in a way that's safe and anonymized so that people are not further targets of retaliation. That's really important. Um, but it's also important that leaders have a safe space for themselves to learn and, and grow and develop. Look, all of us have learned racist beliefs, homophobic beliefs because we're people in the world and we've been presented stuff that's been inaccurate, flawed, biased, right? Like we all know that. So we're all on a process of unlearning. Some of us are farther along than others. So what are we going to do to equip these leaders to see where they might be today and how the way that they're making decisions might not actually be aligned with their intention, which is to be fair, most of us want to be fair. We want to make the best, most accurate decisions possible, but we're not. So creating a safe space uh, with a coach, for example, uh, with trusted colleagues for people to do their work um, and to recognize what the gap is for themselves between their intention and the way that they're actually behaving and making decisions on a daily basis. Thank you. I see that Sherry has her hand up. Go ahead. I think um, another way, also I agree with Michelle too, um, is what I find that works for me. And I, I am talking to a lot of our local politicians and um, they are admitting to me, you know, so they're outright admitting like, I didn't know or, or, or I don't know how. So I think it's really, really important, especially for a black woman myself. Um, I have to meet them where they're at, right? I can't, if they're here and I think or expect them to be here and I jump to there where well, there's that whole gap there that is missing. So it's really important to, I have to meet them where they are and I got to bring them along. I can't just jump And if, if it's, you know, they don't understand their privilege, well then let's start there. If it's that they don't understand, you know, black rage or black anger, then let's, let's start there. But it's really, really important to meet them where they're at. One of the things I was able to do with a couple city council members was to get them to pick up the book, White Fragility. This is a book that never would have been on their radar. But it, little things like that, and hopefully they'll pass it on. And, and it's just little things like that. I find you have to meet people where they're at. Building off of that. Oh, go ahead, Safa. Sorry, no, you can go ahead and then I'll, I'll speak. Uh, I, I was going to actually talk about a different um, point just um, off of, um, you know, the mention of books that you have, Sherry. I was seeing that folks are building reading lists in the comments, and I know you mentioned that there's a book club that you've organized. I was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit um, in, in specific relation to, to your work. Sure. So Justice for Black Lives, we have the J4BL um, book club. It's going to be hosted through virtually for now until we get over the COVID through the Niagara Falls History Museum. Our first read is Des Desmond's Cole, The Skin We're In. Um, we'll have our first book club meeting 
November 12th at 7 p.m. Go ahead and register. This is a fantastic read. And more importantly, I know a lot of us Canadians, we like to think that, you know, we're not as bad as the U.S. and things don't happen. But even I was surprised at Desmond's read that this is right down the road from us. All of this was going on in Toronto. Uh, it's a very, I literally could not put this, put this book down. It was so like, what? This was in Toronto? When? <laughs> so it was really, really interesting. And then um, I feel that um, white fragility is such like a bombshell to me that I'm actually saving that until we can actually meet physically for a book club. Because I want to dissect. I don't want to have book clubs with white fragility. I want to dissect. And I want all my brave white allies to come on out. If there's something you don't understand about it, something you disagree about it, something you need broken down and explained to you about it, that's what we're going to do. Because when you understand that, then you're going to go out there and you're going to make your peers understand that. And it's education. And that's the only way we're going to change it. Go ahead, Stefan. Thank you so much for that, Sherry. Honestly, yeah, I think understanding that the problem isn't just in America. The problem is also in Canada where you where we live, like where it's not as perfect as we think it is. It's really not. And um, the matter about educating is really true because you need to understand that like you have to like everyone has something to learn. Like I um, when I remember the, I didn't know much of like I'm not I'm not super educated on the Black Lives Matter movement for example and I needed to educate myself and I'm still I still have more to learn every day because I don't know what it's like right I mean I'm not I'm not black I'm not white I'm I'm brown and I mean you know to understand like there's different um you know things to learn and just I, I just need to learn every day so I was just like thinking about that and I'm gonna I'm gonna definitely read right fragility and check that out because I I I need to read more <laughs> every day thank you Safa I appreciate that um I think we have time maybe for one more question so I'm gonna try and squeeze it in we only have a couple minutes left um but that question would be um what would you tell all of and this is for everyone what would you tell all of the young women leaders out there looking to find their voice and stick to their values in their leadership journey Safa has her hand up go ahead I guess um, what I would tell all the young women leaders out there looking to find their voice and stuff that, you know, just don't give up, be true to yourself and, you know, stay strong because at the, like, even when you, like I mentioned earlier, like if you, even if you think things are getting really tough and it can't get worse or it does get worse and you're just like, oh, like this is, I just want, I just can't do this anymore. Don't just keep swimming, you know? Like I said, just keep swimming because as a wise fish once said, just keep swimming. <laughs> that's, that's lovely, thank you so much. Michelle or Sherry, would either of you like to speak to that? Go ahead, Sherry. So I actually posed this question to a couple of the other girls at Justice for Black Lives and what we collectively came up with is stay true to yourself, um, I believe that we're all leaders. We just have to step into our power. And you, you have to remember, especially women alone and especially black women, we've been groomed and we've been told our whole lives we're less than. Don't believe the hype. I know it just like Safa said, it's so hard to go out there and combat. And then when you've been told something for so long in your life, even though you don't want to believe it, you hear it, right? Even when you don't want to hear it, shut it off. Don't believe the hype, keep, stay true to the course and fight. We're all women warriors and we can do this together, black, white, brown, it doesn't matter. Stay true to the course, stay true to yourself and be authentic. Thank you, and Michelle? I think great minds think alike because we all have the same message. Um, and mine, it, it actually came from our keynote um, advice that she gave me recently as I was going through something. She said to me, remember, this is Tricia McLennan, uh, remember who you are. Remember who you are. You're going to experience pressure to change, right? You're too, you're too much, right? You're too loud, you're too extroverted, you're too bossy, you're too decisive, you're too quiet, you're too shy, you're whatever. You're going to be too much of something for everybody. And that has entirely to do with them, 
right? That is about them. That is not about you. And in fact, what it's telling you is that people want you to play smaller, right? That they want you to play in a zone with which they're comfortable, but, and you could do that. You could do that. Um, but what a missed opportunity is it is for the rest of us who don't have the opportunity to see you shine, to see you rise, to listen to you, to learn from you. So by you playing small, you're actually doing all of us a disservice, not to mention, as Safa said, all of those young women and gender non-binary people who are coming up behind us and who are looking at us. So remember who you are. You are a person of value with tremendous potential and other people's opinions of that are a reflection of them and their baggage and their stuff. Okay. So remember who you are and just keep swimming. Love that. It's going to be in my head for the rest of the day. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate that. That's a really wonderful sentiment to close on because we're actually out of time and I appreciate all of you um, for, for giving your insights today and all of you in the audience. Um, for those of you in the audience, um, I want to encourage you to connect with the panelists directly through the one-on-one -on -one chat. If you have more questions that you know we couldn't get to um, due to time today. And for folks that were interested in the registration for the Justice for Black Lives Book Club, you can register on um, Sherry's event profile. Um, so thank you again so much. Thank you for your time. I, I hope that folks really um, took something from this and have something to think about and chew on a little bit for the rest of the week. Um, again, thank you so much and, and have a good rest of your day.